<laughs> Welcome to the Manus School of Music. Uh, this is Dr. Paula Rosen, and we are honored to be here with none other than the Dean, um, and his name is Richard Kessler. Uh, he is running the show here, musically speaking, and in other ways, I'm sure, as well. And we also have Lydia Liebman, Hello. one of our reporters at Education Update, and we are just delighted to be here. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. So we have only 100 questions. But okay. We'll, we'll start with the first one. <laughs> Instead of 20. <laughs> um, George Herbert was one of my favorite poets, and he's a great 17th century poet from England. And he used a phrase, the music of the spheres. And I just wondered if it was your goal, your overarching goal, to bring music of the spheres to each student's life, and, and if so, how? Well, I think it is the goal to bring music of the spheres to every student's life, the students here at Manus. And subsequent, that, subsequent to that really is an extension to that, the idea that the students at Manus really receive a rich education in music and outside of music. And then when they go off into the world as professionals, they really they enter the world, in my view, as artist citizens. And they do many different things. Some of them will be teaching music in K-12, some of them will be performing in opera comp with opera companies, with orchestras. Um, others will be basically working um, in policy. They'll be working with arts organizations. And I, in a way, what I see is preparing these students to enter into a world in which they can be ambassadors and artist citizens. And so that's really how they bring, how they will bring the music of the spheres um, to many, many more people beyond themselves. Is the Mattis School of Music a school that gives bachelor's and master's degrees, and how about doctoral degrees? Just bachelor's and master's. We don't do a PhD program, um, although we do also have other kinds of professional certificates. Um, we also have a, a diploma for our extension division, which is like a community division. It's actually a degree granting um, a program we have there in extension as well. If someone is an adult reaching the age of about 50 or so, and they decided that they would like to become a music teacher, can they get those kinds of courses to enable them to teach music or teach voice here at Manus without getting a bachelor's degree? Not as a certified K-12 teacher. There's certainly many of the things that we do at Manus prepare, um, prepare people to teach music in community music schools privately. Um, the, the, really, the education has been doing that traditionally for many, many years. So if you attend Manus and you graduate as a piano major, you graduate as a voice major, trombone, oboe, whatever it might be, you really are prepared, in fact, to go out and teach. And in addition to that, our vocal program, our voice program, has a specific focus that they've been providing around voice pedagogy to prepare, vo to prepare the vocal majors to be the best teachers they can be, in addition to the best performers. Um, Lydia, I'm going to pass to you in about a minute, um, but my next question is, what is the most popular career, if you can answer this, because I know you've been here since September, uh, that students choose in, in the field of music? I think that it tends to be around um, orchestral instruments that tend to be the most, you know, the, the instruments that fit into the orchestra. And uh, I think and the largest number of those are strings. There's still an amazing number of people all over the world um, who want to play and want to become professionals in, um, on string instruments, on violin, viola, cello, double bass. So the performance still outweighs the teaching or the other aspects of learning music? Without question. Although they're all interrelated, but the performance aspect still is where um, the most significant mass is. You had mentioned a little while ago that uh, the students here end up in all different fields of the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, where have some of your alumni, I guess, ended up in the music industry? Well, I'll give you some interesting examples, because often I think what the school likes to do is it likes to talk about those who are on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, and we have them including um, one of our graduates who's performing at the Met right now, Danielle Denise. Um, but I would speak about an interesting aspect of this. Doug McLennan, who um, received, I believe, a bachelor's degree and perhaps a master's degree from Manus as well, over 20 years ago created a website um, called artsjournal.com. And artsjournal.com is an aggregator for arts news from around the world. So it's a website that everyone in the arts field goes to if they want to know anything about what's happening across the world. So they're drawing in all the different information from all the major publications in the world. They also have a series of bloggers 
um, and I happen to be one of them, although I haven't been blogging much lately <laughs> since I took this job. But they have a series of bloggers, maybe about 25 of them, who offer all kinds of commentary on things going on in the arts world. And um, Doug, in addition to that, has become one of these people who's sort of a, th a thought leader in the arts field. And I think that's a perfect example of someone who may have come to Manus with a specific career in mind. But, um, as, but after they worked their way through the Manus education and gotten out into the field, that they were prepared, in fact, to do something vastly different and extremely important. I'm curious, because you mentioned that you had, um, you had obviously, been to Manus, and then you went to Juilliard, and you taught at Manhattan School, and now you're back at Manus. Yeah. Um, what are some of the differences between those music programs that are all very highly esteemed? The, the thing that distinguishes Manus from the other two um, is that Manus has the most rigorous musical training in terms of theory and ear training, perhaps of any conservatory, I would argue, in the world, actually. Um, it's something that we're looking at as a question of, um, do we want to continue the focus like that? But basically, if you know anything about music, um, if I were to tell you that every student graduates from Manus, Manus being able to solfege and set in clefs, it's a type of training and skill that no other school provides. And it's pretty impressive. It is, and further to the point, I think Manus's perspective has always been, it really looks to develop the thinking artist, the analytical, musical, analytical skills. So it's not just an issue of how fast and how loud you can play, but really the issue of um, sort of the, the developing the musical mind, the thinking musician. That's been Madison's really sort of that that's been Madison's sort of distinguishing factor for for very many years. Does that approach you think yield more creative composers? Is that what happens with your approach? I'm not sure that it cre it necessarily um, prepares for a creative composer. I think what it does really is I think it creates the sort of richest ability to think through music, to understand music, to analyze music. I think in terms of sort of habits of mind and ways in which you understand it, I think that it does provide an edge. Um, it, also, it also has its other consequences in a way. Um, what it means is because we've provided to a large degree, I would say double the ear training and theory um, that your average music conservatory provides. What it means is it leaves little room in the curriculum to do new things. So the balance point is very important, and it is something we're thinking about. But literally, if you took a look at the requirements in your training in theory at Manus versus, let's say, the Eastman School of Music, we're literally providing double. Um, it's, it's unheard of. It's really an old world approach that many schools have given up on. Where, where would you recommend, because there's a, a ter terrific choice. There is. There's terrific choices all over the country, and I think um, you know, I would say many things. I mean, to, you know, I would never be anything but honest with you. I would say um, I think the finances are important, and I think that every family will look at that, and where can you get the best um, scholarship. I think also you have to understand your student, your child well. What's the best school? What's the best fit? There are some people who are looking for a very, very rich and rigorous um, humanities-based education while also being able to access conservatory-level courses. There are very few places that provide that. It's one of the things that I like about being at Manus because we're part of the new school and that therefore we can access and we're part of a larger university and a very different kind of university um, because of it, because of having um, schools such as the Parsons School of Design here or having programs that are connected to sort of progressive causes, um, having a liberal arts college as part of so, the new school. So can you, you provide, you can provide Yes. The liberal arts in addition to the music if yes. somebody comes to Manus because they access the new school. Absolutely, they can access the new school larger and in fact of the things that we'll be doing over the next five years it will be to further integrate Manus with the new school. But these things are very important and I'll give you another take on this. I know some people who have been, who have, been, who have shied away from conservatory education because they believe basically that they want a very rich education and they feel the conservatory education is too narrow. So they might take a look at a school that's, um, you know, I'll give you an example. I know I've seen people in jazz go to Wesleyan. Now, if yes. they can get into Wesleyan, what happens is they receive a first-class liberal arts education, one of the great liberal arts colleges, while also receiving a first-class jazz education. So there are a lot of options. There are some students that are very much sort of tunnel vision about what they want to do. There are other students who really, some of them, in fact, 
um, have multiple interests. And as a, another thing I like about being in Manus, we have trumpet majors here who are also studying photography at Parker. The requirement that the students at Manus um, do their studies at the new school as well, that liberal arts education, or can they have a strictly conservatory education if they wish to? You know, I don't, I, I, I've had this question come up many times, and I, I have more and more trouble understanding what's strictly a conservatory right, education exactly. and what's not, to be honest. But what you basically can do is, one, we are part of the new school, so the dormitories are at the new school, so student services is at the new school. So there, more and more of our liberal arts courses, actually, are being taught through the new school, through Lang College for liberal arts, um, or through the new school for public engagement. And we're also looking at developing new degree programs, for example, we um, are in the very early stages of developing a, a five-year Bachelor of Music, Master of Arts Administration course. That course we would do in very close partnership with the New School for Public Engagement through its Milano School, which provides the yes. nonprofit management. Um, what a wonderful idea. And so and it's, again, the beauty of the New School. But what, what I would basically say is you still have a bulk of the courses here at MADS, but you have op, op, all sorts of options for electives as well as some of the core courses at the new school. And I think that we'll be doing much more. Um, and I think I could see when we'll get to the point of where all the liberal arts courses would be essentially taught down at the new school. Yeah, Magnus is 94 years old. What a terrific thing. We're having a big celebration in six years. We hope to be here. Yes. Yeah. I hope so too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will be. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> what are your plans for the future? Well, I think. The plans that I have for the future, and something I've been talking about not only with my colleagues at Manus, but with the leadership of the new school, and it was very central to my coming to Manus, is I would like to be able to evolve the conservatory education to truly and fully reflect all the things that artists need to know and be able to do today. I still believe that primarily the bulk of what conservatories do in the United States and, and, and abroad, is really based on what the field was like 50 years ago. The core curriculum is relatively unchanged at most conservatories. It's really just, it's preparing students to, you know, to audition for the Philadelphia Orchestra. It's preparing students to enter, to become part of a chamber orchestra. But again, what happens is when you think about this, you think about the, the, the things that students need to know and be able to do, different from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15, 20. Um, for instance, the whole area of teaching artistry. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the teaching artists were barely a blip on the map. Today, it's a full part of what many people do to pursue a career as an artist. And still many of them, if not all of the conservatories, basically what they do is the teaching artist training, the work that you might do in teaching artistry while you're a conservatory student, those things happen as extracurricular on the periphery. These things should be brought into the full curriculum. They should be embedded into the core curriculum. Um, the, that would be one kind of change. I also think in this day and age that all, even if it's primarily a classical conservatory, that all the students should learn how to compose in performance. I believe that all the students should learn how to improvise who are performance majors. I think that all of the performance majors should also learn or become fully acquainted with commercial music as well. And I also would like to see other changes happen. This will be the last little piece of it. I think it's a little bit of a conundrum to me that the music schools have been, and a lot of the arts colleges are insulated from a lot of the challenges and issues that the arts fields face. So for instance, I think that arts organizations and the arts field at large is being asked more and more to sort of look at the issue of relevance. What does it mean to be relevant for a museum, for an opera company, for an yes. orchestra? What does it mean to engage audiences? What does engagement mean? It's really sort of a sort of a call to relevance, a call to engagement. And I think that these kinds of fundamental questions, which are around us in the world, inhabited by our graduates, that those questions should be embedded within the conservatory as well, and that just because you're in college, it shouldn't be shielded from these kinds of issues. So I really look to bring more and more of the real world into the conservatory. These things are, are particularly important. Agreed. I definitely agree with you on that. That's a great goal and not an easy one, necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> and talking about the future, what do you think about digital music? We're living in the age of technology. I think that, you know, um, that technology has changed the world. 
And it certainly changed it in terms of arts and music. It's, it's changed it in terms of dissemination. It's changed it in terms of access, which is related to dissemination, but the ability for people to access music, not only <clears throat> at, a fing at your fingers, fingertips, the idea that you could just all of a sudden hear something on your iPod, but you can access types of music and kinds of music that you couldn't have 20, 30 years ago. You know, the idea, let's say, when I was graduating in Juilliard, that I might want to look for uh, uh, some music from the continent of Africa. Well, I'd have to go to you know, a record store, and they might have a few, you know, a few LPs um, of some music from of what they would call world music. Well, today, it's all at your fingertips. Everything that you could possibly think of, whether it's world music, whether it's experimental music, whether it's um, jazz, whether it's classical, whether it's pop, whether it's country and western, whatever it might be. These things are all changing the face of music. Then you also have the ways in which students are now and people are creating music by a technology. So, you know, there are kids today who have grown up around things like GarageBand. Yeah. And they're, they're creating their own music without having done, ever been influenced by music teachers or performers. And that's changing the ways in which these people interact and relate to music. And these are things that we need to understand. Or it could even be in the creation of music, the actual parts. It used to be that there were people who would write down the parts by hand. Yeah. It was very expensive. There was a whole business, a whole industry. My um, mom used to do it. There you have it. <laughs> music copyists. Yeah. Um, today, composers, performers create scores via technology. So all of these things have just changed the face of music. And I think that the interesting thing, perhaps, of it is that it's, it's going to be the ways in which all the kinds of technology come, are brought to bear on performance, meaning sort of cutting-edge violins, high-tech violins, meaning the ways in which performance you know, aspects merge, whether it be the ways in which visual, visual arts can more easily merge now with things like music or music theater because of technology. And I think that we're, you know, I think that just, it's such an exciting time because of all that. Now you were the executive director for a number of years at the Center for Arts Education. So you were very much involved with kids in schools at different levels, K to 12, I believe. Yep. Um, it's, uh, music is such an integral part of a person's life. I feel it's a very enriching and wonderful component. I'm sure you agree. We have heard that fewer and fewer kids are attending concerts at places like Carnegie Hall and Lincoln Center. There are fewer that are attending or are interested in classical music. How do we bring them back to that? Or maybe we don't want to. What's your take on it? You know, I don't I worry a little bit less about the issue of how many what the age grouping is in terms of Carnegie Hall. I, I think I think there's tremendous interest in music. I think there's more interest in music than there's ever been, and I think that more people are engaged in music than we've, um, than we've ever seen in the history of the world. Also, technology's made that possible. Now, granted, it's all kinds of genres, but there's more, you know, when you look around you, and, and it has negative aspects, too, and you look around to all the people listening to their iPods, there's more people listening to music today than ever before. There's more people, I think, creating music and interacting with music than ever before. I think really the issue, there are a couple of issues. One is, I, I worry and I'm deeply distressed and have been for a long time that the urban public school systems true. are shortchanging our students when it um, comes to providing music and the other arts as part of their education. This is particularly important because so many of the students um, being underserved so many of the students being coming from families below the poverty line, where the parents might be working two jobs and they can't afford to bring the kids to after school programs or to community music schools and things like that. So that if so the last opportunity for these students to receive a music or an arts education is in the public school. And the grant the great irony to this is the ones who get the most music at home also get it in the school. And the ones who get the least in the homes get the least in the schools, and it should really be in some ways, I think, the other way around. So I worry about that. I worry about the, the, the issue of providing broad access to music for all students in all schools, and because I think um, the way I see music and the other arts, music to me is like oxygen. Music is the sound of birds singing. To deny um, the ability for, for children to sing to deny the ability for students to draw, to paint, 
um, to learn how to play, um, to hear um, to hear powerful performances of Beethoven or Bach or Duke Ellington, um, that this is shortchanging um, all of our, our society. I, I have a one last question about the relationship between math and music, which some people make reference to. Any thoughts on that? Well, I'm going to tackle it from a slightly um, circuitous route. I spent a lot of time on this when I was at the Center for Arts Education and in K-12 work that I did years before that, too. One of the really interesting things about this is, from the math perspective, when you hear mathematicians, mathematicians speak of math. They speak of math as an art form. They speak of math in terms of narrative. They speak of math in terms of poetry. And um, when you meet a mathematician and you speak to them, there are all sorts of ways in which it relates to all the arts. And you realize actually that math is an art. Now that being said, I think, you're, I think that there are fundamental relationships in the structures of music um, that are where the, the people that I've seen who I think have been the strongest in terms of being able to sight read, being able to sort of um, decode musical notation, have I also, I think, even though they haven't always recognized it themselves, also had very, very strong innate mathematical abilities. And that it's not unusual to see scientists, especially in math-related science, so let's say it's quantum physics, that these scientists, these doctors, are almost always musically oriented. Again, sometimes they don't know it, but there's a reason why there's doctors or orchestras. There's a reason why um, Albert Einstein was so committed to music. Um, this is only scratching the surface, um, but that we have always seen scientists um, relate and connect to music in really extraordinary ways. And, and I think that they do access um, some of the very same parts of the brain. But, but again, I think the most important thing for me is that interesting thing. When I first started to hear mathematicians, mathematicians speak about math in the schools as opposed sometimes to math teachers, or the ways in which math in the schools is often approached in terms of testing and flat knowledge of math. Right. But when a mathematician speaks of math, they speak of art, they speak of beauty. Right. It's really kind of an incredible right. thing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, this is such a pleasure. Oh, this was you. a musical and intellectual.